Hello and welcome. I'm the Restless Kaiser. And I'm Woolly Mike. But together we are... Modelling for Advanti. Well, we're a bit late to the party. And that is entirely my fault. So I'm sorry you're seeing this review after this product has been released. Um, Warlord did send us a copy of this about a week before they'd sent us like preview stuff, PDFs, tokens. We'd had a play of the game and it's just like a run of illness among the production crew here, which is basically me. Um, <laughs> and then we've only just got to review it. So I am sorry about that. But we had a play of it and we know quite a bit about this product. We do. It's like a pro. Do you want to get a, get the wrapper off? And, yeah. and um, did you have a chance to watch them? I didn't play it at the loop, but I got to see some of the, their nice mm. little demo tables. So, Absolutely. And a lot of other people did play it as a loop. Yes. Obviously. So uh, give me a brief overview of the box contents, Mr. Woolly Mike. So we get 108 page Acton Panzer rule book. Excellent. Quick start booklet. Two 156 scale hard plastic Panther A medium tanks. Two 156 scale hard plastic Sherman 5 medium tanks. One hard plastic Sherman Firefly 5C. Uh, two ruined farmhouses. Tank stowage and accessories. Acton Panzer British and German asset cards. Event decks. Full color decal sheets. Vehicle damage markers. Tokens, markers and data cards. At tank Ace data cards and skill cards, action phase and time tracker, and six-sided dice. The short answer is you get everything you need to say except the play map. Yeah. Yeah. Right down to terrain. You, get, you even get terrain in here. All right. We'll talk about these later. These are, these are some points. Ooh. So, Ooh. Good. So some weight to the box. Yeah, it, it is. is a deep box. Dimension-wise, because I compared it, it's the same width um, and length as a bolt action army box, but it's quite a bit deeper than most. Yeah. So, rule book, softback rule book. Quick start guide, blood and steel. Mm -mm -mm. Um, yep, and this is for the forces that come in this box, which is the uh, British versus Germans. Tank topper with the quick reference guide and the usual couple of rulers. Or box topper, as they're also yeah, called. That's the word. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I like that they do that. Yeah. Fire fluff. Boom, fire fluff. Ooh. I didn't realise it was that, though. <laughs> well, oh. Tiny D6. These look like they're like 10 mil, if that. Yeah. Eight, nine, maybe. So, uh, starter stowage pack bed rolls. Top roll. We'll look at all this yep. stuff in detail. So you Two get some blisters of stowage. Uh, that is your event deck, I Event think. deck, yes. German force cards. British force cards. Morella. These are your assets. Tokens. Lots of tokens. Token set. Complete token set for playing the game. And uh, sprue. That looks like the Firefly sprue. Yes, because the machine gun is blocked off. And two Shermans. Two Sherman Fives. British data cards. Excellent. And decal sheets. Yep. Two Panthers. Very nice. Love me a Panther. And the the ruined farmhouse looks like the same as from. It's them. It's yeah, from their ruined Hamlet yeah. set. It's their it's their bit. All right, we're going to sort these pals out. We're going to talk talk it through. So the way we're going to structure this video is we're going to talk about the game, the rules, the tokens, things are, and we'll talk about the tanks and things at the end because I think a lot of people will already be familiar with the kits. They're not new kits. They're great kits, but they're not new kits. So let's focus on the like the bit that everybody wants to know. Yeah. Yep. So if we get the tokens out, it's probably a good way of structuring uh, the conversation. Uh, while you're doing that, I said that this this thing, this um, Actong Panzer Blood and Steel booklet, this is the like, it's a combination of your build instructions, some fluff about the game. I think it's got a starter scenario in it. Yeah, it's got a starter scenario. Definitely seen that. There you go. Mission one, first plot. Kind of telling you what to do. Because the forces in here are quite small for the game. They're not tiny, 
but they are small. But it's telling you like this is a mission to do with this. The other thing that's important about this probably is the stowage bits that we've got over there, which are in metal, it's painted them up so it's a bit clearer what each of the different bits are supposed to be. Sometimes when you've got a pool of like bits of metal, you're like, well, I wonder what that is. And, well, that one's yep. a blanket and that one's a bedroll. So it's really nice that they've done that. Um, so the tokens then, start from the top, because I know you've got thoughts on this. So uh, we've got a timer card. The game, uh, you choose a time limit, sort of uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, up to 90 minutes. And, I mean, I think the scenario is usually set the time. Yes. Yeah. And each turn has three phases. So in phase one, you choose your initiative uh, to decide the order. And you can look at, your, if you pass a radio check, you can look at the tokens and allocate them. Mm -hmm. If you don't pass a radio check, you don't know which initiative is. That stays the same for the three phases. Yeah. You then have a activation phase where each take takes its actions. At the end of the third phase in the cleanup, you take it in turns to roll one or two dice, and then that is how many seconds of, or minutes have elapsed. Now, the game says, add it up. So you start at zero and go to 35. For example. My view is, is that in all the movies, the clock's counting down. Right. So, yes. you, you know. So for RP reasons, we would play a 35 minute game starting with 35 minutes on the clock and counting down to zero. Yeah. Now, you don't need to do that. It's obviously a little bit harder on the mental maths. But this point about the three phases is a kind of really core part of the game in how it works. So although there's initiative, which is turn order, and we use tokens to work that out, it only changes every fourth so, so you'll have a round in which you, a part of the turn where you allocate initiative, which you may have more or less control over. You might be quite blind, depending on radio checks. But that then is fixed for three for three turns, three three sets of actions of all the vehicles on the table. Only when you complete those three and you move the timer on, do you then reset that initiative so it's an interesting mix i liked it some people don't like it some people feel they should do initiative every turn i think that mixing up i know the turn order this turn but i don't know it next turn i think that 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 changes player agency i think it's good it does um because we, we didn't do it on the live stream but we discussed it afterwards when you're in phase three you've got to think about yes yeah, so I, I i could take a shot or I might get better initiative next turn in which I can aim and shoot at you. So mm. in first and second turns, you're looking at loading and getting your aims on mm. and then getting ready to fire. And then on that third turn, you're thinking, well, next turn I could have better initiative. Or yeah. if you've got initiative one, there's a good chance you're not going to be initiative one next turn. Yes. And so you need to think about it. So that's a little bit when it, at the end of each cleanup. Slight comment, two little sliders, paper. So they're the paper sliders that they've used like in Blood Red uh, Skies and Cruel Seas and Victory at Sea, I think, uses them. And I understand why they do it in that they can print you a basically a paper paper yeah. clip. So just... But this is actually a key piece of turn tracker. <laughs> um, and it's pretty fragile. I, I would definitely would want to be looking for a, for a MDF yeah. Like th some third party. I know Skytrex are making some inlays for the unit cards. But this is something I'd like to have a higher, I've like more durable version. Again, of. I've seen it. The, the Skytrex kit, as far as I understand it, from what I saw, is it's going to be card trays mm -hmm. with little token holders on the side. Yeah. There will be a tray for this with two sliders right. in MDF and also some card holder like a deck holder tray for this card. Right, and okay. And if you don't know what we're talking about, hopefully we found you a link on the website yeah. when, when I come to put this together. So you Skytrex is, I think, now wholly owned subsidiary of, of yes. Warlord. And it does, it's taking on some of their product lines. Cruel Seas in particular is one. So they're not, they're not kind of doing this dodgily. They're doing this. This is part of Warlord's offer for this game. But they do that kind of thing through Skytrex. We'll provide you with whatever information Skytrex yeah. have, um, as we understand it. Because that, that 
that piece is that, and not let's start with the criticism, but it's not really up to the job. It'll do you for your first few games, but you're going to lose this little bit, this tiny yeah, bit of paper, that, which is your turn tracker. You put that dot on over phase one, then phase two, then phase three. When you reset, you set the time yeah. and then reset. And it just would have been nice to have those made out of yeah. stronger materials. So then our token sets. I think we'll come to that one in a minute because I think we need to talk to that one in relation to the unit cards. This is your general tokens good quality token good quality tokens yeah they, they're strong they're big enough for purpose these so what you've got on here is you've got your i have aimed at or i have spotted these are all double-sided so there's there's i've seen that tank and then there's that i have aimed at that tank yeah um, so each tank will be given an, a, a unique letter a, a up to l yeah so my tanks may be a b c and kaisers will be d and e and so when my tank aims at tank A, or sorry, it spots tank A, I put the A token put on the, my the tank. Spot, yeah. Yeah. That you've been spotted by A. Yeah. Yeah. You don't put it you don't want to put it on the on the target that's been spot the spotting. Yeah. You want to put it on the one that's been spotted because it says who spotted it. Yeah, and so there's spotted and there's aimed, which affects the ability to shoot. And your hit chance effectively, yeah. Yeah. Then we've got Ambush, Terrain, and the Initiative Token. So you put one token in for each tank in the force. Yeah. Take it in turns to pull them out. If you pass the radio check, you can look at them and assign them. If you can't, you pull them out blind and assign them blind. And then you've got to wait till they all turn over. Yeah. Uh, the ambush thing, there's bits, there's, you identify bits of terrain on the board which are potential ambush points, and they are potential ambush points. In in these other cards, you might have a Panzer Shrek team somewhere on the board. The tanks can do things to clear these areas, but what I liked about the game was there was always pressure that the tank wanted to do a lot more things than it could. It wanted to move, it wanted to load, it wanted to spot, it wanted to shoot, it wanted to clear terrain near it, and it couldn't do them all. And it was actually, because I played the Panthers and you played the Shermans in both versions, um, the, both well, games that we played. Well, I played Americans. You played like Americans. Force, yeah. yeah. It was the Panthers are high point tanks, and I, and I was really pressured. I can't clear this ambush terrain because I need to reload my blimmin' gun or I'm gonna be out of this, you know? So I, I really like the, the, you know, the number of things that you wanna do, you did not have the capability to do them all. It's good that they provided two tokens for each letter because then you can put it on the card and on the model. Yes. <laughs> um, although if you're serious about playing this game and building new tanks for it, I would decal up your tanks with yeah. letter with those letters. So then you're not, you know, have all your tanks labelled A to L. Yeah, I've got some A2 Shermans that we played in a practice game. Mm. And I've done them as a platoon. So there's the A tank, the B tank and the C tank. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, German markings definitely don't work like that, but it's a game. And yeah. it's definitely easier. All right. Um, so that, that's the main token sheet, I think. Yes. We talked about. Now, the tank unit cards then, let's get some of these out. There's a British and a German one. These are lovely little packs, um, all neatly wrapped. And mine, these ones are, yeah. You should have both in there. It's gonna be, yes, it's one tank pack, isn't it? So what you're gonna get in here is you're gonna get copies of the tanks that you've got in, in the set. Uh, and, but these are all double-sided all their cards, which is good. So you get the Sherman 5, the Sherman Firefly, and that's the two different sides, yeah. Yeah, so when this card is one side Firefly, one side, yeah. yeah. If you wanna make a true uh, 1944 Sherman British tank platoon, it's three Sherman 5s and one Firefly. In campaign, that would quickly become less Shermans, of course. <laughs> um, and it's it's only later, it's not really in Normandy, they didn't have enough, but more, as they get more and more Fireflies produced, that number does go up to two, and in some cases more. You know, in 1945, you have some troops that are just Fireflies. 
The Firefly is the, is the upgone, the massively upgone version of it. So these are, they've got a lot of information on here. And I so said, if you're new to this game, you, you might look at this and feel a little bit overwhelmed. They've done a good job, in my opinion, of blending the need to have a lot of information with the need to read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the need for it not to completely cover your gaming space. I don't think you can afford to have five cards like this in your gaming space if they get any bigger. That's right. And I, and I think that that's probably part of the size problem. Because if I, if I get out a, a, um, a challenge playing the game, is being an old man with, with tired eyes and butter fingers, is the tokens that you need to put on here, you'll need to put quite a few on there, and they are quite small. So, yeah, so first of all, you've got, and this could be a, a modelling bit, is, is your commander sticking out his head out of the hatch, or is he buttoned up? So there's a token that goes on the card to say... Whether you're buttoned or unbuttoned. unbuttoned. It affects visibility, I think, mainly. And it's sighting. Mm. And then you've got four types of shell, which go in the ammo rack. And so you've got... You don't track individual shells, except for your kind of HBAP stuff. Yeah, specials. You'll have a limited amount of... They call them specials, but it's all AP. It's all the, yeah. the, the superior tungsten penetrator type stuff. Um, and then you have smoke and HE right. and regular AP, right? So I've, I've gone and magnetised it because I mm. found we, they moved around a bit. So a starting tank, basic tank, you'll have an HE shell in the ready rack. You'll have an AP shell. And then depending on the time of the period of the game, the quality of your tanks, how many specials you'll have, mm. and they go into the ready rack. Yes. And then you will, lo uh, sorry, choose a round type to load. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's ready to fire. So it's a two step. You can speed load, which is a test on your crew. Right. So there's, there's a step between deciding what you want to load and it being loaded. And that's either the tank's whole action for the turn or a successful skill check. And what's interesting is that different gun types can skip that step or can't skip that step, or if they fail it, they have worse or better results um, based upon the gunner's skill. Because the three skills that it tracks is the commander, the driver, and the gunner. There isn't The gunner and the loader are kind of one guy on this. Yeah. All right. Um, so you choose your round to load. You make the skill check and you yeah, know. and depending on the gun, how easy that is, and, and there is a chance of making it making failures. Yeah, you assign a grade. So even though there's five or six man crews, you have the commander grade, the gunner grade, and the driver grade. So in this example here, we've got a three star commander, mm -hmm. which all of his tests then are on a two plus. Yeah, and it prints that on the numbers. It says it, it's got yeah. the three star bit, and then it tells you their skill check. And I don't recall the skill checks ever being modified. No. You know, like a skill check at minus one or a skill check at plus I, one. I don't think there were... It, I don't think that the, happens. It might, it might do, but I don't remember doing it. I think there were I think there were event cards that... Um, that might, there might yeah. be an event card that modifies it, yeah. Uh, like with the driver attempting a cross check. Mm. And there, uh, there's, a, there's a car, that, I can't remember what the name is, it's like Mr. Gear, and he, as he's driving through the rough terrain, he's Mr. Gear, yeah. and he's stopped. Yes, yeah, it's modified. Yeah. So we've got the shells, we've got some damage tokens. You can take a uh, running gear hit, a, a turret hit, or a body hit, mm -hmm. and get too many of those, your tanks out of action. And these are damaging hits. So you have. What, you know, when we're talking about shooting now. Yeah. You? you have several elements. It's actually quite granular. It's actually quite... I mean, I spoke when I interviewed Colin. I said, you know, the game has got a lot of granularity to it. And he said that I, we are hearing this word a lot <laughs> at, at, at Salute, both in the weapon types. So the, your armour... You, your tank is going to have armour ratings of different values in different situations, not just front and side. But if you hit the running gear, it's a lot less armour. You know, even if you've hit it from the front somehow. Um, so you roll for location, you roll for penetration, and then you roll to see if you blow up the tank or just do some damage, etc. So there's there's several steps to that. So you can be carrying damage with these markers. But it is, 
it's significant damage these markers represent. Yes. You know, this is not, you don't accumulate damage points. This is like, mm, you nearly lost the tank there when you yeah. took a hit here. If you get another one here, it's game over. Yeah, and then the other token is, is the part of the first start step in each phase is you, you assign a movement mm. order to each tank. And you've... They're generous. They're not, they're not really, it's not like an age of sale game where you have to say like, I'm going to yeah. turn 20 degrees to the right after moving 100 yards type thing. They're broad categories. So if you say you're going straight ahead, you can still potentially pivot. You can, you can drift a little bit, depending on skill and situation. If you turn to the left, you just can't move without turning something. I, they come, if you don't take the move straight ahead thing, the other, the, the turning options and the reverse options, they're going to reduce your movement. Yeah. yeah. So you take a left turn, you might only turn left by one degree, but you've halved your total movement. Um, so, you, you know, and the same with backing up or, or halting. Halting is going to affect your shooting quite significantly. If you're halted, you're going to shoot a lot better. But of course, you're not going to move. So again, it, it, it's quite good. You tend, we tended to reach a point in the game where a tank really was just bedded down now, and I'm just, I'm just in a gunfight. But early on, while he's still manoeuvring for position, it, these things really, really matter. Yeah. All right. Um, so that that's the token and a little bit about the gameplay. Other bits that you got in this pack, you got a lovely little combined decal sheet, which I assume is new because it's got Balkan crosses and stars on it. Not seen that one before. And it's also got a few, is that, there's a division marker, the bridging German. weights, yeah. um, and even some um, tank names for, for crews that have named them, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, you get these tank ace cards, because the other type of card you get here is you get an example tank ace. <laughs> So these were just like the others, except the crew is pre-printed. So these are real historical figures, real historical tank crews, and they're from these settings, so far as I know. So you get a, a preset in all of these, and then you get some, some knowledge on the back. You get some history and a photograph, etc. So in the case of this guy, it is Sergeant George Dring, or Killer, as they called him. Um, I like him because he's a sergeant. Yeah, as a people, you know, you, you tend to think in like in a lot of sci-fi games, every squad is run by a sergeant, and every group of five or more people is run by a junior officer. So, you know, a lot of tank commanders are, are corporals. Yeah, you know, the platoon commanders are sergeants, certainly in the British Army. Um, so that's that's the unit cards. Cards we've got a few other cards to show you. Explain a bit more about gameplay. So you've got the assets. So, at the start of the game, we, you, you agree on a points total, and tanks are given class, so there is a quick way of building a, a force, mm. but the, the, the primary way is that you've got a crew calibre and the tank. So, so you don't pay for a rank 3 gunner, you pay for a veteran tank crew, and then roll to see how many stars you spread amongst them. When we started... We thought it seemed to be all about gunners. We then quickly realised it was all about commanders. <laughs> and then concluded having a bad driver wasn't a good idea. <laughs> yeah. so, because you could become really unstuck with a bad driver. It didn't matter nearly as often, but it was often more important when it mattered. To use the terrain well, you need a good driver. Yeah. So every and time you hit a linear obstacle, you're going to stop or make a driving check. And, it's like, and that's might often going to leave you side on to somebody when that happens. And you know. that's a key point of the game is that there are, the arcs are 45 degrees from the front, the side. Yeah, it's, it's a very generous system for hitting a vehicle in the side. Um, so you know, being able to pivot while you're, while you make a straight move or a reverse move and being able to make your exit complete And, and your also, if, if your tank's side on and you put the turret facing and the shot comes in from the side, there is a chance it still goes If it the hits turret. the turret, it hit the front. If yeah. it hits the hull, it hit the side. Absolutely. So turning the turret to face. And the they, they have a hull down rating as well. So if they're behind terrain... It less... changes, I think, the hit table. So you basically can't hit the lower part of the yeah. tank. 
And going back to granularity, I believe that that table was different based upon the class of tank. Yes. It's a number on here. The, there's a hold down rating, which is basically the number below which your tank is covered and the shot yeah. would have hit the terrain rather than the tank. We've gone off topic. We were talking about assets, Mike. Yeah. So the tank yeah, you, 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 you choose your tank value. Mm. You ran randomly generate your crude total. And then if you've, depending on the level of your commander, you then roll another table to find your asset points. So there's random crew levels and these assets. They're things that you really should do at table. You build your list beforehand, but then you don't still know exactly what you're bringing to the table until the kind of pre-battle phase of the game, which again, I like that a lot. Now in a campaign, that will be different because your tank crews are persistent. These assets are national specific. You get a set number of points. Some of them are very powerful and game-changing, like an airstrike, or uh, you're showing them there, that's the 88. Um, that's going to knock out many tanks at many ranges, as you can probably imagine. But it costs you five out of the points. Yeah, and I've never had five asset points in a game. <laughs> in fact, I've played three games where I had one asset point and for one asset point you're going to get like a really basic infantry attack or an yeah. artillery attack but if the other guy you get an artillery attack it can knock out an open top vehicle like a hellcat you know it's pretty unlikely but it can happen and like this this is the this is the uh, artillery is a one point um mm. from above and uh panzer knacker so during the game, you've got a clump of trees is an yeah, ambush we, terrain. We talked about this ambush terrain, yeah. Yeah, so you can clear the ambush terrain with a HE shell, mm. but you've got to load an HE shell and use it. Yeah, that, that's not a good <laughs> idea with a proper tank, to be honest. But uh, you do have... We didn't... We did, I don't think we read up on it fully, but the tanks do have machine guns, so mm. they can um, assault with those to clear the ambush yeah, terrain. Th that kind of reconnaissance by fire approach. It's like, I fired into that, nothing moved, there's nothing yeah. there. Now again, this is one of the things that I like about it. In the, in the few games that we've played, I played with a pair of Panthers in each case. Although mo the games that I played ended up being quite one-sided, it didn't go the same way in both, in both games. But I came away from both games thinking, I need I I don't want two panthers. It's it's too many eggs in the basket. I don't have enough options open to me. I think I want some lighter vehicles or some cheaper vehicles to be and that's without even objectives on the table. There's just too many things that I want to be able to do and I wasn't able to I didn't feel that clearing terrain was in any way on the list of things that I could achieve. I was just loading and firing, loading and firing. So, because they got more tanks than me, I've got to knock some out or I'm going to get well, overwhelmed. Well, the, the two games we live streamed, I had the Pershing mm. with the big nasty gun. I had the Easy 8 with the average gun. Mm. And I had my little Greyhound, which was just cause you... Yeah, but it could still do damage on the side yeah. and so forth. Um, right, so the last thing is, and this is again, this game's really quite modern feel to it. And, it flows in unpredictable ways is because of the hand of cards. Yes. Because although we've seen that the asset cards, they've been relative, we've not had a significant asset outcome from an asset card. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. No. You don't get many of them and they're not, they're not easy to play always. And you actually have to have events before you can use them. We found the event cards to be incredibly impactful and powerful. Yeah, so you start off with a a minimum hand, which is di driven by the your mo your highest rank commander. Yeah, so there's a minimum hand, and then if you the, the the highest rank commander gives you extra cards, so you can have like three or four cards. Yeah, um, you can use several cards during a phase. Yeah. But at the end of the turn, you can only draw as many cards as the rank of the person that dictates. Yes, yeah, so it's possible to start with a bigger hand than you will you will keep. You, yeah, absolutely. So you need to be careful of them. And so reinforcement cards is when you can activate a an asset. And some, some of the assets you use straight away. Other assets you, 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 you put them ready. 
But you that this is what the cards look like. So the um, the reinforcement card, as yeah. you, as as you were saying, they enable you to bring assets that you have into play. They don't exist beforehand, but most of these cards. And obviously, once you have all your assets in play, they're just annoying because that's a dead card, it doesn't do anything. Um, but you know, things like what well, we've got here, Fog of War. It tells you when to play it, and it tells you what it does. And I, I love all that. It's, it's and it, they're not written like you know, like your Warhammer rules that feel like they're written in hyperbole or something it says play anytime effect plays the smoke marker on a friendly or an enemy tank right that's that's it that's the entire rules writing for this and some of them are actually that is counter cards right yes and you do you do sometimes get quite a bit of that and sometimes you're going to have a card that's crap but it's going to counter something really important yeah because what was the name of the card is it bullseye is it bullseye this card is awful no, that's the. No. Uh, Where's the. It's. Weak spot. There we go. <laughs> Weak spot <laughs> is a game changer of a card. And I never got one, but Mike did. So normally when you roll for penetration, you add a die, you roll a d6, you add the penetration value of the gun. Compare that number roll to the armor, a little bit like Flames of War, I yes. was, to be honest, um, to see if you went through. And the game is well balanced in terms of the anti tank ratings of the guns and the armor, because that's that constant battle in World War II. In an op gun, the vehicles is rel is harder than, op than a basic op armoring. Yeah. All right. So then you kind of, the op armoring often. Is, is very late in the process and then a new version comes out or whatever. But you out, you end up with fairly comparable numbers where the guns are slightly better than the armor, but not a lot better. Weak spot allows you to do is instead of rolling 1d6 and adding it to a number like 9 or 10, is roll 2d6 and add that to that. And that's going to mean that a light gun can penetrate a tiger <laughs> and with a decent roll. In one of, one of the test games, it was a 75 Sherman, which only had a 7... Fire, uh, seven uh, penetration. Right. But then I rolled a double six. Yeah. <laughs> and the over penetrating leads to a clean kill rather yeah. than damage. So it's not it's not just that it makes a weak tank be able to penetrate a stronger tank. Is it enables a, a strong tank fighting against a strong tank to knock it out rather than yeah. damage it. You know, because you're going to get an average of three and a half on an extra D6. And I think it's if you penetrate by more than three, it's destroyed, yes. isn't it? Or maybe it's more than four. But it's because the numbers are really close together. I, I think that card is too powerful. We discussed that. and I, I think I, I, if, I, if there's an errata comes out for this game, it wouldn't surprise me and say, roll two and pick the best. Because yeah. that's still really strong. Yeah. Um, that, that would be my view on yeah. it. But if I had a card that said counted weak spot, I would never use that card. I would hold it for the rest of the game <laughs> until I came up against weak spot. Now, do I like or dislike it as an interesting question? Because I this is kind of a good quality beer and pretzels game. This is just tanks fighting at point blank range. It's kind of a bit silly, historically, Yeah. right? That You know, the, the kind of really close quarters with no infantry in tanks. That's not really how tanks fight. In fact, that's how you don't fight with tanks because you're going to lose them. But that's what this game is. So having stuff that's really kind of a bit out there and really swingy, I do like that. And it's a one-hour game, you know? If you were unlucky this game... You're gonna be lucky next game. So I don't, I don't know where I feel. I, th that one did stand out though. I, th I think as as perhaps being a bit too strong, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't outright ban it. I, th I think one of the issues that, again you said is you know having two panthers and you were disadvantaged that you had two different panthers. You had two different cards. Yeah. You had an um, a, a, an A and a G or maybe. Well, they provide you with the stats for two versions, yeah, and they're the versions that. I'll and I, I, obviously, I I had the the whole American card pack. Yes, and yes, because I only had the starter German pack, yeah. which is just the Panthers at this ta at this moment in well, time. And you had yeah. the whole German, the the whole American card uh, to choose from. Yeah, so yeah. that's why I had a a, a, a a Pershing, an Easy Eight, and a Great Hound. Yeah. Yeah. There's several different versions of the Sherman. Um, the Hellcat's in there. Yeah. Um, I think the Puma's in the German, is it not? 
I've been through the German. There is not a reconnaissance vehicle in the German oh. pack. But when we spoke at Salute to Colin, this is set one. This is yeah. Normandy. Yeah. yeah. That's what this starter set is. Is that, of course, there's going to be other stuff in the future. And there is the information in the rule book. You have stats for guns and stats for hulls in here. So it's quite easy for you to make up your own versions of these. So the, the kind of 1942 stuff is not in here, unless that vehicle was still in. So there's no Panzer three in here, but there is everything you would need to make a stat card for a Panzer yes. three in here, if that makes sense, if you really want to do it. But I'm, I am totally confident that they plan to release other sets, other periods. This is the 1944 set. So, and then, obviously, we played standalone games, but then there's a point is, the idea is to personalise your your tank and your crew. Yeah. At the end of the game... They might if, level up. Yeah. And you get to opp opportunities to level up your crew and mm. give them extra skills, and also upgrade the tank itself. There are tank upgrade rules. Are oh, there? I didn't know yeah, that. I, yeah. So... Next time they go in the battle, they, they they stayed in their tank, they've all gained something, and they possibly benefited the tank as well. Mm, so over the course of three or four games, some of them some some of them do pass away. Mm. Some of them may have survived the battle, but it's they become fatigued. Yes. Yes, so if the if the tank members get wounded, and we had a lot of tank crew wounded, the danger of being commander up is very strong in this game. Yeah, if the tank gets hit and the commander is unbuttoned, he's either dead or bleeding profusely and drops one or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and becomes crap for the rest yeah. of the game. But it's so beneficial to be commander up as well. It's it's an it's an interesting choice. Yeah. Um, to make, and I, I like that. I like you have to make choices that matter. And what we found was nobody buttons up a commander <laughs> yeah. if they don't have to. Um, yeah, because the, the 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 spotting and the aiming is if if your commander's got his head out of the turret, you can almost get a free action. Yeah, to spot. Then you have to use the aim. A, a, a spotted target you only roll one dice an aim target you roll three or four uh the germans i think were even higher slightly slightly, yeah. slightly better at the at the not the aim shot but the, there's this idea of a snapshot as well which is like I, i'm not really ready to shoot and you're pretty unlike you roll two dice and pick the worst no you roll two dice and they've both got to hit Oh, is it that way? You roll the dice and the both got a hit. Yeah, and, or, or more, depending yeah. on the... Depending on the degree of the snapshot. You're not hitting with a snapshot. No. And you're wasting actions because the game is driven by its action economy. I want to spot, I want to aim, I need to reload, I need to fire. And that's all without doing anything about the ambush terrain or anything <laughs> like that. Yeah. You want to do all of those things every turn, you're going to do one of them. The skill checks often mean you can do it for free. Yes if you meet the circumstances. So the loader makes a skill check. You fully load as opposed to partially load. The commander yeah. the commander up, if you spot, it was free. Commander uh, buttoned up, you spot, that's what you did this turn. An example in the game we played is Mike's Panther was going to drive up the road and he was going to pivot left to avoid the trees so he could have a line of sight and his driver failed the test so he just drove straight ahead and parked behind the trees. Couldn't see anything, couldn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. In, in general, I want to play a campaign game of this. I want at least one with you. And then. Yeah, I definitely would want to explore those roles. I think, and I don't know, you may have a similar experience at home. And um, all too often, my games have a campaign system. You feel like I want to know the game before I want to commit to a campaign. And what you do is you play three to six ga games of a new game. And then you kind of had your fill of it for, for six months or whatever. When you play a lot of games as yeah. we do, it's like six games or something within a couple of months is a lot of one thing for us. And you get to the end of that and you didn't do the campaign because you didn't feel you knew the system well enough or whether yeah. it was worth it. And then you, you're not likely to play that game again for a while. If a game's got a campaign system going forwards, my, my hope is I will play that campaign system from the beginning of my experience yeah, I might make some poor choices along the way, but it's very rare that I've gone back to a game that I've played a dozen games of and said, all right, now let's do a campaign, and then kind of had the 
had the passion and sustainability to do six to ten games of it and really get the fruits of that campaign. So I, I, I will definitely, when we start do playing this, we're going to be following the campaign system. Yeah. And I'm going to be like trying to kill your tank commanders <laughs> as opposed to your tanks. Um, yes. So how do I get better than you? Is that because I'm going to be buttoned up, but I'm <laughs> trying to kill your guy. Um, so, look, we talked a lot about the game. We didn't even show them the rule book, look. So, the rule book, it's very nicely laid out. It looks thick. This is Mike's as opposed to the one in there. It looks pretty thick, but there's there's a lot of information you don't need for immediate play no. in here. Like you say about the about the campaign, there's quite a few things you're gonna need to look up. Your first couple of playthroughs, you probably are gonna find it difficult to find where the bit you need to know is. It's got that bit that you have with a lot of rules saying, I feel like I read this somewhere, but I don't remember where it was. And you're gonna read the same 10 pages over and over again. But after two games, I was pretty confident I knew what I was doing. Our only problem was is that from sort of like tradition, mm. if you find a keyword that's in bold and it's in capitals, mm. then it normally means there's a role for it. In this case, it's calamity. Calamity. <laughs> it's calamity. That, that was the one we spent a lot of time looking for. There is a concept of a calamity in this game. When you have a calamity, so for example, if you are loading a heavy shell and you, it takes two load successes to load a heavy shell. If you try and speed load it and you fail, you drop it and it's no longer partially loaded, it's yep. just on the floor, start again. But there's this keyword calamity is not universal. A calamity is rolling a one yeah. on a skill check, but it doesn't always matter. But because we'd seen this term calamity in a box, it was like, well, where's the calamity check? So there isn't a calamity check or a calamity table. It's just some actions could be different. When you roll a one, you have a particular, a worse than yep. failure result, basically. Um, that that was the thing. So although we could find the word yep. calamity in the air, uh, we couldn't. But this is what I was saying, stuff about tables at the back where you could create your own. Um, yeah. other vehicles so there's one list for all the all of the tank, uh, most of the tanks for an ally mm. and it gives you all of the stats for it and then at the end of it it tells you which gun that tank has got yeah and you then go to another page which has got all table. the different guns yeah copies of the tokens again a lot of people will have received a pdf of this as well even copies of the cards so that's like. what i've done is i i've photocopied those onto uh, paper and then stuck them onto these, oh, these magnetic cards. It, yes, th these are the magnets you put in the bases of boxes for your like magnetized trays. Whatever, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so the the cards stuck on one, and then all of the tokens, and they they stay in place. And so when we get the see the sky trek stuff, then hopefully then it all works. Just together. drop in because they're the same size. Yeah. Right. All right. But so as a game, I, I I enjoyed it. I did. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a lot. I feel that um, running a campaign where you get invested in the particular, you know, imagine you get a rookie crew, you take it through its first mission, you have a bit of a tough game of it, but then they skill up. You go into game two, it's like, these guys are going somewhere. I didn't pay many points for this time, yeah. but actually the crew's all right. Then you don't want to lose this. <laughs> That's, <laughs> you know, by game six, you might have some real pros on the table. But it might be in a crap tank because it was yeah. at the beginning of your campaign. And I, I re again, I like all that stuff because it changes. It's adding multiple player-driven objectives. The mission says you've got to go there and do this. The player says, yeah, but I mustn't lose tank C1 because <laughs> that's got my pro guys in it. That's Ginger or yeah. whatever, you know. That's Ginger's tank. So it's a good little game. Um, let's have a look at the bits that come with it then. So let's go back to the components, then we talked about the game-related components. Let's talk about the vehicles themselves. So you get a couple of Panthers. I left this one still in the bag. Mike has got, I've got one here. Obviously, I've already built, well, I've built the ones for this set. I had one from before. So this is um, looking at the uh, type of sprue frame that it is. I believe that this is an Italeri kit that's been rescaled for Warlord, uh, which is the way that they, they do some of that. 
the instruction, the build instructions are not on a separate sheet. They're in this uh, blood and steel place there. Um, so they're quite nice. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward kit, which is good because it could be horrible. Because Panther, like Tiger, has got interleaved road wheels. And I wouldn't want to try and glue them all on and keep them all straight. But fortunately, it follows that kind of standard design. A lot of these tanks, you get a big lump of a lower hull. You stick the upper hull to the lower hull and you've got half your tank built. You, your wheels and your running gear fit on. Then you attach the tracks. If you're going to mess up your model, this is the moment you're going to do it. Especially because of the way Panther's tracks works. There's a bit of shaped sag on this. Um, and just the way that it hooks over. There are teeth here to guide you against the underside of these road wheels. But the bit where you're likely to have a problem is where the top, the upper and the lower part meet. They meet fine, but if you just glue it and leave, gravity will pull them apart. So you definitely need, you might want to use a CA or a super glue for that bit and, and hold it, or a plastic glue and peg it, but make sure that that is properly dried before you go, or a gap will open. It's not a flaw in the kit, it, it's just gravity works against you, I'm afraid. Um, if you find that the track pieces are not lining up properly, have a look at your wheels again and how you've attached it. Check for flash or something, because it probably means they're not straight. Because once that's dried, you're stuck with it. You do also have the uh, the drive wheel and the, the idler wheel yeah. um, are, are separate pieces. But I think that's just so that they can get the shape into the mold. Um, Cause this is obviously this injection molded stuff. It wants to be as linear as possible uh, where the stuff, it doesn't hold detail very well in depth. And the wheels are a good example of that. The facing depth is really, the facing um, definition is good, um, but it's pretty simple at the back. Cause you don't see any of that. That's just all hidden behind the skirts, which you then put on later. So that's the Panther. This one has got the Zimmerit on it. So I think it's the A, the middle one. Yeah. What you're getting. Um, there's three Panther types, D, A, and G. And visually, the main difference, I think, is the engine exhausts. And I think it does provide you with both types, does it? It's got the single and the triple exhaust stack. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So I think it, it might even provide you with both. In this kit, it's going to tell you... Which, no, that's one long piece, Mike. Uh, okay. That is one long piece. Yeah. So the exhaust structure is different, I think, on the A to the other two. I'm not enough of a rivet count no, but there is a difference, but it's really quite small. Um, the point about the Zimmerit paste, though, is they're not on early and mid-war tanks, and they're not on super late-war tanks, they're, but they are, it's quite common in Normandy. And what Zimmer it is, is it's, a, it's an anti-magnetic. I mean, we call it a paste. You want to think of it more as like a clay than a, yeah. than a you know, it, it's thick and it dries hard and firm, but it is kind of pasted on in a, in a semi-liquid form. But yeah, it wasn't a bad kit to build at all. Um, there is an aerial here. I didn't put it on because it's not going to go in the trays. It's just going to snap off. I've started using micromagnets. Yes, you have, haven't you? From um, um, pintle mounted machine guns. Pintle mounted machine guns and aerials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's That's they're, they're only the, like, the tiny two mil yeah. army painter magnets. Yeah, one glued onto the hull because it's so small. Mm. When it's glued on the hull, it looks like another piece of the, the yes. turret. So he's actually got the magnet is on the outside of the hull, but painted black with the aerial, it looks like it fits yeah. in just fine. Same with the machine gun pintle mount. You look really closely, you can see it, but on the tabletop you can't. So it's an easy thing to add to existing models. Um, it, 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 it all started with a, an M3 half track. We spent all the evening building it. You blew it up the first turn on the next day when yeah. we used it. And then the the 50 cal broke before I even put it in the box. Yeah, yeah. Um, one bit about the kits is, uh, just looking at it... Um, the button done button bit, you know, being able to build a tank with both options. It, it's only got one cupola mm. and one turret cap and quite a sturdy officer. 
So that's again the nature of because it's yeah. a single piece with that injection molding. You're going to find, although most of the Italeri kits have got a commander figure, they're very uh, kind of upright and plain. And, and when you're doing that in a bolt action game where their their figures are quite heroic and very manly and muscular. Your tank commanders look a bit weedy, yeah, but they do make a range of tank commanders for this game. Um, so yeah, Panther kit. I like the Panther kit quite a lot. Built a couple of them, painted them up. They're fine. Um, is it a good tank in the game though? Yeah, I'm not sure that it is. Panthers thing. The Panthers built to better T34. Like we need something better than that. Panther we think of as a powerful late war vehicle. It's a late war 43 plus replacement for Panzer IV. It's the new main tank. It's the new medium tank. Because actually, although the front armor of Panther, Pan Panther is very good, the side and deck armor and roof armor is terrible <laughs> um, and that's how they're going to make it fit within that weight class keep the speed up etc so but in terms of points in the game i think a tiger was maybe a point or two more yeah and what tiger's got is comparable levels of front armor comparable levels of firepower but much better all-round protection you know and two proficient tankers you should never be being hit in the side but this is a tank skirmish game in four ranges that feel like 50 yards you're gonna get hit in the side in this game and you're probably gonna lose your tank when it happens and, and when you're facing three that spread out and went in three directions right. yeah and your try your driver didn't want to do his um pivots well he wanted to he just couldn't yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all right. So that's that's the Panther kit. It's a nice kit. We then have two other kits in here to look at. Yeah, and so these are in Ziploc bags. This is the Sherman 5 we're going to look at now. So Sherman 5 is the M4A, the M4A4. Um, so that's the, that's the British naming of it. Um, it's again, so this, when, when they've got these square frames, I think these are kits that Warlord have commissioned. When they have this kind of round tubular stuff, it's an existing Italeri kit that's been rescaled. And generally the difference you can tell is these were built as Wargamers kits from the ground up, as opposed to picking an existing model kit that isn't overly complicated. Um, and I think you can really tell that like, just in the size of the pieces, the thickness of the it. The thickness of the plastic of the upper hull there. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it, it's just all solid. together, you know, and and there's a lot less fiddly. But although the parts count here is actually higher, I think, than the Panther. Part of that is, is that down to the fact that you're making multiple versions? I'm not sure. I don't think so. The... Uh no, it's got the single. It's got the single gear gearbox at the front, and it's a three piece bolted. But it's got the single. So this is this is the transmission cover. Yeah, and then the the bolt on rib ridges are actually. Oh yeah, the ridges are separate. So again, during I've never the, seen that during the evolution, there were the there's the cast holes, mm -hmm. there's these welded holes. Mm. There is a single piece cast front gearbox. Mm. And then there is the three-piece bolted gearbox, which is what this has got. Yes. And what you tend to find is the ones in British service have this um, transmission cover, whereas the ones in American service have the, the, the flat-faced cast on the side. The thing with Sherman's, that kind of A1, A2, A3, A4, is it's not that they're later. It's that they're made by different companies. Because these are made in the many tens of thousands, something like fifty thousand. Not sure, something like that. Something of that order. It, it, you know, it, maybe it's thirty, maybe it's seventy, but it, it's the, somewhere in that area, which is a huge number for World War Two standards. But different companies made them to slightly different specifications. Particularly, all the variants have got a different engine because of the engine that that company is. It, it's their engine, and that's why this this is specifically the Mark V because it's a slightly longer engine deck. Because is this the one with two bus engines yes. or three bus engines around yeah. a single crankshaft? Yeah. Apparently, Americans hate it. Is there a nightmare to to repair? Because it's got 
it, it, it's literally several boss <laughs> engines, but they had them and they could make them. And they were what we used. So they are going to look the different versions of the Shermans. The A2 and the A3 look very similar to me. I'm, I, I can't tell the difference. But this does look quite different and it's quite a bit longer. Yeah, in, in, in the other games we play, that you can tell these when when they're in the in the in the bag without turrets because they're, they're that bit longer. Yeah, they're that bit longer. Yeah. And then you have these um, bulge plates on the, the side. The applique, yeah. This, this is applique armor. So um, this is the this is one of them uh, World War Two stories about like Tommy Cookers or Ronsons or Zippos. You know, it's lights lights first every time. Is Although the, you need to be clear, the, 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 the they're called Ronsons. The Zippo was actually a nickname that the Marines used for the flamethrower version as well. Yes, so well, I think that's later. Yeah, the flamethrower tanks the Marines called Zippos. Yeah, in definitely in Vietnam. Yeah. I don't know when that started. Um, but I think all of that stuff is actually post-war. Yeah. But there was a genuine belief among the crews that when these vehicles got hit by in the side, the ammo would ignite because of where it was stowed. And that's why you have these strange bulge plates on the side. They're specifically an extra inch or two of armor over where the, the ready racks of ammunition are, I think. Yes. They're over, they're over those areas. The testing that was done after the war indicated that it made no difference, but it made the crews feel that something was being done. But it's like every time we get into it, there's a big ammo fire inside the tank and we all die. And we don't like that. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? Oh, we just stick a plate over the side and be all right. They moved to wet ammo storage so, later. So in the, in the uh, M4A4, sorry, M4A3EZ8, yeah. they're because of the change in the suspension, the wet storage, is, it was underneath the mm. crew compartment rather than along the sides. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to know about the, the later versions of Sherman's and American vehicles in general, it's not the A number, it's the E number. Yeah. <laughs> the E numbers are variations, which is why the EZ8, it's got, most of them are 76 mil armed. They've got the, the alternative suspension, yeah. the, the slightly broader tracks. There's like, this is the, the, a yeah. later version of it. But again, the different companies, not all of them made E8s. Some of them, you know. So anyway, Sherman kit. When I get a model kit for a war game, I want it to look like this. Big, clearly distinct, simple, chunky pieces. Just like, like the teeth on these tracks, they're really big. They're not so big that they're going to make look ridiculous on the model, but they're definitely going to engage these wheels properly and line up. But the fidelity on them is still good. You've got the, that kind of V-shaped tank tread that, you know, you're so familiar with, with the Shermans. You've interestingly... On the, on the upper third tracks. Piece, oh, yeah, the upper on tracks. On the upper tracks, the, the there are teeth gaps that fit with the return rollers as well. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely. It's a, it's a cleverly designed thing. So where there, there isn't space for the teeth to fit because yeah. there's rollers there. Right. Um, this third sprue here feels like it's optional. The side skirts is, is one of those... I've, I've got quite a few books because painting models for the channel, I try mm. to make them look a little, lot more realistic. Mm. The amount of tanks that don't have the skirts on is far higher than yes. with the skirts. I think the skirts come off because this is not armour. This is just boilerplate. Yeah. Um, so you see, they tend to have them in the desert. They tend to have them earlier rather than later. But it's a nice feature to distinguish one tank from another. Yeah. You know, so if you've got a tank platoon, you want to say, which one, the commander tank, I'll make it a little bit different. Stowage is a common way of doing that. But just putting the skirts on one of them it will, will also do yeah, that. Yeah, so we've got some stowage on there. We've got some spare wheels. Mm -hmm. um, and we've even got a Cullen head cutter. Bottom left. Oh, here, that's what that is. I'm looking at the wrong side of it. I'm just looking at the yeah. flat side. The Collins hedge cutter. Right. Yeah. Which, again, I think these are only used on American tanks. Because we weren't fighting in the Bocage. No. So we didn't need them. <laughs> so if Collins hedge cutter, <laughs> or um, as, they, as they were called in the time a lot, rhinos. Yes. The, 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 the Bocage, if... I mean, I'm sorry if you already know this. Right? The Bacardi is not just a hedgerow like an English country hedgerow. It is a it is a steep, tall bank of earth 
with shrubs and bushes and trees in it and they're maybe eight to ten feet wide sometimes much more than that and you just can't go through that and the way that you can force your way through a two foot wide privet hedge you know this this stuff and that part of normandy is like sort of 50 by 50 meter boxes of medieval farm plots with these huge banks of earth all the way around and the germs have set each and every one of those boxes up as a mini murder hole yeah and so the collins hedge cutter was a way because that because they've got fixed entry points it's like there's no other way of getting into this little box the collins hedge cutter was they they were looking for a way of making breaches in this. And they've done it a bit with bazookas, but you just don't have that much. This is really soon after D-Day, this countryside. But there's all these steel beach defences. The hedgehogs. Right, and they're there to rip the bottoms out of boats at high tide. So you're forced to land at low tide so you don't rip the underneath of your boat out while you're going in because you can't see them underwater. But of course, once we've captured the beaches, moved in land, it's like, all these steel girders uh, welded together over there. What if we cut some V-shapes into them and turn the tanks into... Well, I think the tops already have the V-shape. That's what they, they cut in. And then it's they're just, it's angle iron. Free, yeah. It's just three pieces of angle iron stuck together. Yeah. With points on the top. Yeah. Um, and then they've taken them. Is it Cullen who's actually the guy that... I think he improvised one and demoed it. Yeah. I, I think there were more than one. But these were basically just made in, in like, I say workshops. I'm talking about improvised yeah. workshops on the beach. They basically just welded these things to the front of the tanks. But I think it was a... a I mean, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent there, but I think the Bocage is at the western side of the of Normandy. It's very much an American sector yeah. problem because the British are fighting around Caen. Caen is yeah. a town; it is not in the in the heart of this. There will have been bits. But I think the Collins yeah. Hedge Cutter is really for American ones, but it's such an iconic bit of Normandy yeah. <laughs> that everybody wants one, right? It's a Sherman. It must have a. If it's a Normandy right. Sherman, it's Normandy Sherman. It's got to have a Collins Hedge Cutter. Yeah, I'm surprised it doesn't come with the um, extra large exhaust, the big beaver tail fans for the exhaust. We're going off on one now, Mike. That's just for the DD <laughs> tanks, and this and is not a DD. Tank. It wasn't a DD tank. So the, the wading tanks had a beaver tail. Did they? So they could go ashore in the deep. Yeah, the DD tanks had the full skirt. Yeah. And then tanks that were driving onto the beach, just to make sure. They, they had a... Because they'd have to wade. Yeah, they had a big beaver tail. Oh, right. There's only two, most of them still t took them off as soon as they landed. Yeah. But there are a few pictures of in tanks inland with this beaver tail. Very nice. Last thing in here is a Sherman Firefly. Iconic bit of Anglo-American rivalry. We have them, they didn't. Oh dear. Um, so what's happened with the Firefly, we've had the experience of fighting Tiger in Tunisia. We've had the knowledge of fighting most of the war with guns that are not good enough. No, of reaching a point when our guns would not be powerful enough and we don't want to go back there. We've got the 17 pounder. It's an amazing piece of gun, but it's huge. But we do start looking at, of everything that we make, what can we get a 17 pounder in? And they managed to squeeze one in to a Sherman, to a Sherman 5, but they do have to make some modifications to it, which is why you don't see them in American service, because it's a British gun, as opposed to all the others, which are the standard American guns, the 75 mil. So what they've done, they've modified the Sherman 5. It's kind of like one of these getting a rugby team into a mini type things, though. It's like, well, on paper, we can arguably get 10 guys in there. However, we've got a lot of give. The first thing they have to do is they have to lay the gun on its side. Right. The breech is in a funny angle. Because it's really awkward for the loader. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's actually now reaching across yeah. the gun. The, the travel on the gun is far much, uh, the, the, the recoil of the gun is much more. So if they'd left the radio in the turret. Yeah. It would get smashed every time they fired the gun. So the, the turret muscle on the standard Sherman 5 has got a radio and, and, and other things in there. Not on, not on the Sherman, and it's got a different turret bustle. Yes. I don't know whether they've moved the radio further back. The radio's in the bustle completely. Right. Um, As and, opposed to partly in, partly out. And then it's, I, th I think it's a 76 and a half mil gun. I think it's not in the, but it takes a much longer round. Yeah, yeah. Which, it's, it's like rifles 
have the smaller caliber than pistols, but they're much many more grains of powder in that round, yeah. right? It's a much higher velocity round. And for an anti-tank gun, it's v you know mass mass times velocity equals energy. So you yeah. want a fast, heavy thing. So they, the bigger shells, they've not got the under tank storage, so they keep the gunner out. The machine gunner, you yes. mean? Not the gunner. The <laughs> machine gunner. gunner. Sorry, the bow um, gunner. Yeah. So. And what Warlord have done in making this kit is, and what's really nice about it, is two of the sprues are the same. We've got this sprue which we sent, which has got the skirts and things on, um, and the tank commander models, and the lower hull, and the tracks and so forth, because all of those commanders are common. But then, then the central sprue, which has got the hull on it, the turret, the gun, and a few other pieces, is different, mostly. This, so you'll see that when I overlay them, there are parts that are common and there are parts that are not. And I really like that because they didn't just needlessly make an entirely different sprue. <laughs> so if you've built the Sherman 5s, you can transfer the experience of building those kits onto this. And although there are some differences, there are not major ones. Obviously, the gun is much longer, much larger. Um, and is this a... Is this now? This is the same turret muscle, isn't it's, it? I uh, know that that's the that's the add-on. Is that piece there? Well, they provided uh, it for both. Hang on, now. right? We just had a bit of a look at that because we were thinking, hang on, that doesn't look like the turret muscle. So actually, the turret muscle we're talking about is these, and on the Firefly, you basically buy both of these, and yeah. you just have this one on on the other one. Um, but yeah, I really like the fact that you know they've they, they've kept a common. The hull is different, don't crop up, cut out all these pieces and, th and, and, and so forth. Use the right ones at the right times. Because what you'll see with the the Firefly is they've blanked off the machine gunner position like you mentioned, yeah. the belly gunner, he's gone. That's ammo storage. It actually carries less rounds than the standard 75 mil Sherman, but there's a, they're much bigger rounds. They're much, they're much longer. They're carrying a lot more charge. But these are great little kits. I've got to say, I really like the I really like the look of these. They're nice and simple, no unnecessary parts in it. Yeah, I, I like these. I, I, as I say, I've got the Tank War starter set, so I built the free A2 Sherman 75s, mm. um, and I don't think they were up to this standard of kit. No, are they are they artillery ones? I think they are. Yeah, but this is. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not criticising these kits, but these kits were designed for modelers, whereas these kits are designed for war gamers. And a modeler is going to build one and going to spend some time over it. Yeah. And a war gamer is going to build potentially 10, 20, whatever whatever his needs are. So simplicity and so forth. Is, Although it did, still does give you all the, the towing lugs and, it, and the eyelets. Yeah, um, but you it, don't have to use them. Yeah. They're, and they're, I can tell you that I usually don't. Yeah, I put them on the front. Of, it's probably where the only time I use them. Yeah. Because you've got the, some of them... You've got oh, because quite, the towing hooks are right at the front and yeah. they stick out. Yeah, if, okay. they, if they're visible. There's another bit in here, though, which I did not know was coming. Which is, we get these little bits of stowage. And these, surprisingly, are in metal. So there is a these these are clamp packs in that new style that that they that they're using, where there's often an empty there's often a blank box because in these because they need them, but it just seems to be the style of clamp pack that they're moving. I, I, I recently bought some American Airborne with the captured weapons. Yeah, and you got two figures in each yeah. socket. So cool. I got a bicycle. You've got a bicycle. Oh, yeah, so same what they were. So this is the starter set stowage. And this is Clan Pack 2, Acton Panzer. Acton Panzer starter set. So this is Pack 1, Pack 2. Whether you can buy these separately, I don't know. So Clan Pack 1 is that it, it, it's, it's bedrolls, tarps, jerry cans. And they're in metal, and that surprises me. I'm surprised this is not in Sirecast. If I mean, you know, in truth, I think Siocast is um, the medium that I would expect them to make these things out of these days. Now, you know, that Warlord resin, they call it. Mrs. Kaiser's already, like I say, pr provided me with the American starter pack. Yeah. And it comes with, there is a, another custom set for American armour of some bits and And there are some 3D printed pieces in there. There's... 
a doll, little doll figure, right? A guitar case, right? And a rack of bottles, so some beers, right? And I've just noticed on this one, it looks like it's got a banjo. Oh, it's a mandolin. There we go. Look at that. Oh, mandolin. So you're yeah. Gonna get, what you're going to get in here is that. That looks like a standard British water canteen. That's yep. an Ameri That's a German, a German gas mask, gas case. mask case. Which mm. helmet? That I don't know whose helmet that is because it's got some texture to the roof. It's like a like a late war German covered helmet. Yes, is perhaps what that is. German bread bag. Bread bag and water bottle. Um, the plate for a mortar, I think that is. It does look like a plate for a mortar, yeah. Which is the kind of thing that they might have used a bit of a, as a plique armour. Yeah. Because uh, there's quite a bit of that in the front. That uh, Panzer four wheel, probably. Uh, and a banjo, like you say. So they're nice because they're personalised and it's good that there's yeah. not like just one generic one. Like this is a generic one. You've got loads of different kind of rolled up bits of tarp and bedroll and couple of jerry cans but then these are really quite special like unique little items then we've got some spare track links uh, sherman tracks and some i assume these are going to be pad for tracks and a running wheel yeah and three different boxes three different boxes apart from the jerry cans there's no two identical items here <laughs> and if you're customizing tanks that is exactly what you want you know because you can do it your way you put a bedroll on the back of each of the tanks and paint it all a different color and that is one way of distinguishing your tanks from one another. Well, as, as you saw when we played the uh, live stream game, my, my Easy 8 is the, the Fury kit. Yeah. And on that one, I used a lot of Rubicon. Um, they do some stowage kits. They do some extra stowage but to make it lived in. These these are in, they're, they're in plastic and they're not as good as these. So right. my next ones, I will be using, we'll be using these, these yeah. because they're, they're, they're more specialized so I, I do like these and so i've used yeah. other stowage kits that are available but this and is a nice yeah and especially because it's a starter set yeah starter sets tend to skimp on decals um unit cards these that they often give you like semi-complete versions of what you would buy if you bought a tank you know like this fire fluff stuff they don't need to put this in. There's nothing in the game that requires you to put down like a, an on fire marker on a tank. Smoke is think. the only one. There's smoke. There is a smoke round, but you get a token to put yeah. down for a smoke round. Um, but they've given you these packs of fire fluff. They've given you. They've even commissioned a new decal sheet for this, um, which is which is great. But this is definitely the kind of thing that they don't normally include in a starter set. You might get it in an army deal. I have to say, what you get in the army deal is... Is, is another... Is a different another, one. Yes. Yeah, that are specific to the armies. Look, um, as a starter set, I have not checked the price, <laughs> which I should have done. It will appear on the screen before your very eyes, but it's around about £100. It might be 90 it might be 110 I think at the time of recording, it was somewhere in the region of £100. You would pay that for the five tanks. Yes. Is what I'm saying. Is, is, is really my point. And they're five... Nice. Who doesn't, if you are a person interested in British tanks, having it, the, the best part of a, fi of a Sherman troop is standard. You, you need that in your collection. Yes. If you collect German, you play late war, especially Normandy, do you want some Panthers? Definitely. So the five tanks are not wasted on anybody. Storage is a lovely additional extra, but all the game components, and the game is a good game. Uh, it was a good little game. Is it the game that I'll still be playing 10 years from now, you know, twice a month? Probably not, but it is, is it a game that I'll pull off the shelf a couple of times a year for many years to come? Because it took an hour, an hour and a half, we drive some tanks around, roll some dice and have a few disasters which are funny. Yes. Yeah? Right. That's our thoughts on Acton Panzer. Cracking little game. And if you want to watch us being morons trying to learn <laughs> to play the game, we did stream it back there and I'll put a link somewhere either up there or down in the description where you can go back and watch. And if you want to see a pro playing a game, Martin from Seventh Stone has done a series of games. They're now, they're now really got quite into it. They yeah. know what they're doing. They're pretty slick and he has lovely scenery models, high production values on his videos. So go check them out. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.
If you're still here and you're looking for ways to support the channel, there's obviously a lot of ways down in the description, but a key way is to use our affiliate links to Whaling Games and others. You buy your models from them, it doesn't cost you a penny more, and we earn a little bit of commission. Thank you. Thank you.